think uh, Alexi has the distinction of coming the furthest <laughs> to attend uh, the conference. So we're delighted to welcome him from St. Petersburg. Alexi, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dear colleagues, my presentation is divided into three sections announced in the heading and briefly described in the abstract. I'll begin with I'll begin it with the more or less known Ghaznavid procedure of appointment to compare it with the Seljukit one. The latter is generally considered to copy the former. I'll try to show you that this point of view is not entirely correct. There were at least some bureaucratic reforms implemented obviously by Nizam al-Mulk after his appointment, appointment in 1063 to the position of the Prime Minister. Moreover, the official documents used during both periods reflect not only the bureaucratic reforms, but also the reforms in the Seljukit administrative system. Well, let's get started. The Ghaznavid procedure of appointment is step by step described by Abul Fazli Bayhaki in his Tarikh, as cited on this slide. Every one of you can read faster than I can speak, so to save time, <laughs> I won't repeat the text presented on the slides. Uh, as you can see, the principal document necessary for this procedure was a standard work agreement, Muvazad. That's an official document prepared by an employee himself and similar to the modern contract of employment, consisting of a list of official duties. Such employment contracts for the highest rank of officials were approved in the Ghaznavid period by the Sultan himself as an employer. His approval was reflected three times. First, by his answers to each of the employee's statements named Fasl. Second, by his sealed resolution, Toki, below the work agreement and finally, by means of his orders named Far Farman in general and Manshur and Misal in particular. They were issued after signing the agreement. A rare, if not unique, example of the complete Muvazat prepared by the Prime Minister or more exactly by his secretary is included in the Majmali Fasihi. Uh, and confirms the appointment procedure described by, by Haki. Here is a foreword to this Muvaza. <coughs> its text plainly demonstrates uh, its structure. Uh, an example of the Muvazat article uh, named Fasl describes first a problem or a responsibility in government then suggests how the problem should be solved by person in charge. Uh, and finally, offers a source of finance. As you can see, as you can see, it's, it terms, uh, uh, in terms of its length, the article is very short and consists of only four sentences. Suggesting uh, solutions, the article follows a set official pattern with a, with a formal style of writing, namely the use of the impersonal modal verb in such word combinations as it should be that or it must be that, bayatke. I'll come back to this example again at the very end of my presentation. The contract of employment was approved by the sealed resolution consisted of uh, the Sultan's personal seal and his written resolution. In fact, the seal separated, uh, separated his last answer in the Muvazat from the following resolution, which was presumably named Ahtnama. As you can see on this slide, this resolution contains the Sultan's direct orders to abide by the terms of the contract. If, 
If we compare this resolution with a sealed resolution by the minister of Iraq written under his rescript, Misal, in relation to Al Ghazali's appointment to the head of Baghdad's Nizamiya in uh, 504, we'll see we'll see the direct final order clarifying what should be done in this respect. The structure of the sealed resolution is the same in both cases. With this short survey, I hope you have received an idea on how did the procedure of appointment look at the time of the Ghaznavids. To come to the Seljuk procedure of appointment, I have to attract your attention to the fact that all the manuals and textbooks compiled for the Seljuk state secretaries and published by modern scholars have no references uh, to Muvazat as to the official contract of employment. Why? To answer this question and make this presentation interactive, I would like to offer you a simple bait for translation. This bait was taken from a qasida by Mujir ad din Bailhani, a 12th century state poet. This bait deals with an Arabic word mashruh. We can see that mashruh here is not just the passive participle, otherwise it doesn't seem to make any sense. This word was converted here into the substantivized passive participle, and that could go with the Persian verb bastan. Bastane mashruhe mamlakat. In this substantivized meaning, and with such word combination, mashruh cannot be found in any popular Persian dictionary. This can be explained by the fact that this word became a specific term in bureaucratic court language only in the Seljukid period and obviously lost this meaning after it. To help you translate the bait, I would like to remind you your own appointment to the position you have now. <laughs> <laughs> Remember its sequence. There was a vacancy announced by your employer. The vacancy was accompanied with the list of job responsibilities specifying exactly what tasks you should be doing, their order, how long it should take, and the results your employer expects of you. Hopefully, you met your employer expectations. Then remember how many official documents were issued by your employer and signed by you in relation to your appointment. <clears throat> The list of your job responsibilities prepared by the employer, of course, was uh, the basic document, among others, signed by you, since, th since this document was directly related to your salary. After it, there was the employer's order to appoint you to your position. The order was published and addressed to your colleagues to let them know about your appointment. Now it's Time to come back to our bait. Here is my version of translation. The Seljuk manuals and textbooks show how an employee was appointed to a state position in that period. To cover, to cover the whole Seljuk period from the Greek Seljuks to the Seljuks of Anatolia, I have referred to in my research to the Two, uh, two main sources, the Atabat al-Kataba by Muntajabaddin al-Juvani, the head of the state chancery under Sanjar, prepared for publication and published by the late Muhammad Qazvini and Abbas, Ibal, Abbas Iqbal Ashtiani in 1950, and the Takarir al-Manasep by Kamal al-Din Kunyavi, published by the late Osman Turan in 19. In fact, there, there were three types of the official documents necessary for such appointment. The first and basic document was mashruh.
<laughs> well, also, Mashruch was the key document by the appointment. There is neither complete nor incomplete Mashruch among the official documents included in the Seljuk manuals and textbooks. There are only references to Mashruchs. Why? Because any Mashruch was compiled independently for each position or even individually for a person appointed and thus could not serve as a template for secretaries. Here are a few examples. This one. This one. And this one. I would like to pay your attention to the last example. This is a document, presumably a Manshur, where a few job responsibilities are enumerated in short with the reference to a mashru, where they are certainly given in detail. In many cases, this brief enumeration is presented usually after a subordinating conjunction in order to talk, talk. The second official document was Manshur. Remember again your own appointment. Here are two examples of Manshur. Uh, in the second example, we can plainly see that uh, it was a secretary of the chancellor of the highest ministry, Divani Allah, who had to compile all the official documents except Mashruh. And again, his main job responsibilities are enumerated in short with indication of his salary and with a reference to his Mashruh. The third official document was Misal, uh, also issued on uh, behalf of the employer by a secretary of, uh, of the chancellor of the highest ministry. This document seems to have been compiled in support, in, in support of Mash, Manch, uh, Manchur, confirming its validity after some time, as you can see on this slide. To conclude this section, both Manchur and Misal were approved by the sealed resolution, Tauqi, written on behalf of the employer. Both could be titled as the Sultan's de Decree, Farman. At the same time, Manshur could either refer to Mashruh for details of the job responsibilities or briefly enumerate them. We must not be misled by the descriptive headings given by, the, by compilers of the Seljuk manuals and textbooks to various manshurs and missiles to consider them another types of official documents, such as, for example, Taslim or Tafviz. As, uh, as I have already told you, uh, there were just three of them. Before mo moving on, I'd, like, I'd just like to mention that if we compare this set of the documents uh, with that of the Ghaznavids one, we'll see that the Ghaznavids Muwazat was totally sub substituted with the Seljukids Mashruh. This substitution in itself provides a strong indication that uh, there were some bureaucratic and administrative reforms which took place in early Seljukid time. In the second part of my presentation, I'll try to show you that letters of recommendation have been in bureaucratic use already in the Seljukid period and have been written in support of candidates to the state position. There is a collection of letters addressed by Al-Ghazali to state and religious figures. The letters were collected by a medieval compiler, evidently a descendant of the Imam, 
into a volume published by Abbas Akbal Ashtiani in the mid-50s. These letters were arranged by the compiler into five correspondent chapters. Three of them are related to the Seljukid administration, including Sultan Sanjar and his ministers, and thus can be considered core level official correspondence. Some of these letters represent the letters of recommendation written by Al Ghazali in support of his colleagues and friends for them to be appointed to the state positions. There was a standard pattern for writing the letters of recommendation by a religious scholar. Al Ghazali himself describes this pattern while addressing to Sultan and his administration. Uh, each Muslim scholar is to expound a decision consisting uh, of four things. A prayer, compliment, counsel, and elimination of needs. At the same time, elimination of needs is divided by him into elimination of general needs of subalterns, termed by Al-Ghazali as Rayyad and elimination of the scholar's personal needs. Mm -hmm. The same pattern is applied by Al-Ghazali to his letters of recommendation. With the first three parts, a prayer, compliment, and counsel, these letters had the final key part, elimination of needs. It's in this part that recommendation is given. For me, the most curious thing uh, about these parts is uh, how the scholar achieve, achieves uh, coherence between, uh, between them by creating logical bridges. The final part is usually written by him on a background of the negative social phenomena. Uh, such uh, as the general needs of the Seljuki subal uh, subalterns. Thanks to this part, we receive a lot of facts which concern the social problems. These problems are mainly caused by the negative economical and political factors witnessed by Al Ghazali. They are, for example, uh, a severe uh, drought which lasted for several years and completely ruined the Khurasani crops, or expropriatory taxation accompanied with uh, injustice in judgment, or the provisional government of a certain Seljuki Sultan in Khorasan during uh, internecine wars, and so on. On such negative background, Al-Ghazali introduces a subaltern uh, to the higher administration as a figure capable to change the situation as, and as elimination of the scholar's personal needs. Thus, we immediately see the glaring contrast between the negative background and the positive foreground. I shall confine myself for reasons of time just to one example. The point here is uh, that these letters were not previously identified as the letters of recommendation due to misleading headings given to them by a medieval compiler. The single and key criterion for him to arrange the collected letters was Al-Ghazali's addressees. Thus, the heading mainly focuses on the third part of the pattern, that's on the content of Al-Ghazali's counsel. Well, the last section of my presentation concerns two job statements, uh, the Siyar al-Muluk, or Siyasat Naume, and the Rahat al-Sudur wa Ayat al-Surur. The first book was demonstrated by me elsewhere to have been fabricated by Muhammad Muizini Shapuri, Amir Muizi, the most famous court poet of the Seljuki dynasty, and attributed by him to Nizam al-Mulk. The second book, as you know, was completed by Muhammad al-Rawandi in the beginning of the uh, 13th century and dedicated by him to the Anatolian Seljuk Sultan Ghiyas ad-Din Khusrav I. 
I'll start with the second book. Serious textual research on the book, carefully conducted by our colleagues, differ on what's one of key characteristics of any work, its genre, historical or hybrid. This slide reminds uh, this slide reminds you the structure of the book and demonstrates its originality. As you see, this book is a compilation and there is nothing original except perhaps the author's CV and his personal skills as an adim. What did the author try to say to his royal addressee? In short, first, to introduce himself in the introduction, Second, to show his full loyalty to the Seljukid dynasty in the second part of the book, and to demonstrate his personal qualification as an adim in the final part of it. That's why I totally agree with the claim made by Dr. Ildis from the University of St. Andrews in her recent research of the book. He states that Aravandi compiled the Rahata Sudur with the particular goal of gaining employment as an adim at the Seljuk court. However, there is a question which remains still unanswered. What's the genre this book was written in? To my mind, this is not a book in its modern sense, but rather a compilation similar to the modern project or personal statement while submitting uh, while sub submitting an application. Otherwise, any author could have pretended to the Seljuk state position by compiling such an unoriginal book. If there is an Adim statement, then his professional qualifications as an Adim par excellence should have been compared with the most common qualifications necessary for an Adim. I suppose that uh, for this purpose, Aravandi initially, initially used his mashruk, that's his list of job responsibilities. Then he extended it substantially to demonstrate his extensive experience and to outline his areas of expertise. This supposition is confirmed by both the use of the impersonal model verb, it should be or it must be, by Atke in his definitions of the most common qualifications. And by highlighting his personal extra qualifications in the next six sections entitled FASL. As it's shown, as it's known, this term had the specific usage in both the Ghaznavid and Seljukid court language, meaning decision or opinion, and also applied with the same meaning for the official documents, including the contracts of employment. The same approach is plainly seen in the Siyar al-Muluk fabricated by Amir Muizi. He also extended some of the fossil articles of Nizam al-Muluk's contract of employment with this fabrication trying to prove in practice his loyalty to a new supreme sultan. He also had the same intention to gain his former status lost by him due to the collapse of the Malik Shak's government. This intention was confirmed by him twice, initially in his foreword to the book, and then in his concluding Qasida. For the present purposes, it doesn't matter how, uh, how Nizam al-Mulk's contract of employment was originally titled, the Ghaznavid Muvazat or the Seljukid Mashru, since both were functionally similar to each other. I'm not going to enumerate all the job responsibilities of Nizam al-Mulk. They are around 40. My aim here is to show you that uh, ori originally, they represented the articles given in, in his official contract of employment in either Muvazat or Mashru form. Here is just one illustrative example. 
You can compare an article taken from the original Ghaznavid Muvazat and cited in the Majmali Fasihi with an article taken from the Siyasat Naume. The latter uh, presents one of the duties described by the, in the genuine contract of employment of Nizam al-Mulk without any later additions made by Amir Muizzi. I would like to ask you uh, to find any fundamental difference between them. Both articles had the same content and are related to Ishraf or, and uh, Mushrifan. Both refer first to a problem in governing, then suggest how the problem should be solved by person in charge, and finally offer a source of finance. Both follow a set official pattern with a formal style of writing. Both are rather short and consist of only a few sentences. Moreover, if we substitute the article in the Siyar al-Muluk with the article in the Majmali Fasihi, we won't see any substantial changes. The pattern of writing such kind of the contract documents widespread at the Seljuk court made it possible to separate the genuine parts of the contract of employment of Nizam al-Mulk from the later changes and additions made by Amir Muizzi. That brings me to the end of my presentation. Thank you for your kind attention. Uh, I wanted to ask you about this idea of the mirror for princesses being sort of like um, solicitation of employment or, or, or CVs to be dropped to the rulers. I mean, you have your article, uh, that you mentioned Sarah's uh, New Yildiz, uh article on this. Do you think this can be applicable to most of the mirror for princesses we have? Um, this brings me to mind, I mean, in the text I mentioned before, there is, as I said, there is a section of it which is this is Yasad Nama of Nisam al-Mulk. And in there, it seems to be tailored for this ruler of Kastamonu by leaving some chapters out from the original, reshaping and adding new chapters. So it seems, again, this idea of we're writing this mirror for princesses in order to get a job. Uh, to what extent we can apply that to most of the mirror for princesses or not? What do you think? That was my question. We uh, <laughs> try to, to formulate it. Well, basically, do you think all Mirror for Princesses are application for employment? No, not of course. Uh, it depends on, uh, on the purposes, uh, because uh, the, the easiest way to, to, to show your uh, qualification is uh, to, to, to take your um, present uh, job responsibilities and to uh, extend them. Uh, show, uh, showing that you uh, can do much more than the usual qualifications necessary for your position. So, uh, uh, if, uh, and uh, the problem is that um, if we speak about Siyo uh, Satnome, uh, that this contract of employment uh, of Nizam al Mulk uh, is hidden inside inside this text. Uh, so we have a uh, very clear difference between very short chapters and very long. So very short chapters, these are the chapters of the contract of employment, genuine contract of employment. Mm. Uh, well, th thank you very much for a virtuoso performance. Um, um, perhaps it would be useful to, to try to join it up with the subject, with the theme of the conference or of the workshop. I mean, you, you, I mean, your title was to appoint subalterns to Seljuk state positions. And I think the first example you gave us mentioned to appoint a noble to... So is, is there something about, let's say, subalterns in, in the system you're describing? Would there be extra requirements or extra... I mean that uh, this uh, kind of uh, social lift, uh, when, for example, uh, Al Ghazali uh, writes his uh, recommendation for a subaltern, uh, of, uh, and the subaltern uh, takes uh, a state position. So 
due to this recommendation, the sub <laughs> became <laughs> elite. I just wanted to um, verify the timing about Ghazali's recommendations. Uh, presumably, it's when he's gone back to Khorasan. Um, now, he, we all know about him being a chameleon and about him being very versatile, but he seems to be um, going into new territory, really, here with these recommendations. I mean, is he suddenly turning into um, an expert on bureaucracy? Or, where had he acquired that skill before? Certainly not in Baghdad, he was far too busy. Certainly not when he was wandering around uh, allegedly for 10 years. So um, are we talking about the period, say, from about, um, I don't know, the last decade of his life, or even the last five years of his life for these letters? Uh, mostly uh, the last years, but uh, there are some letters written before his departure from Baghdad. Yes. Uh, so, uh, mm, when he was a, a teacher at Baghdad's Nizamiya, uh, he also wrote some uh, letters of recommendation for some persons. There are about maybe uh, four or five of them. Are they in the Fazal Yes, yeah. yes, yes, mm -hmm. yes. And how do we know that the date is when it is? Is are, are these letters addressed to pe to um, the Sultan, um, for example, uh, the one in power? Um, this is um, after the death of Malik Shah, because but, uh, he didn't get to. Uh, uh, they are mostly addressed to to uh, to ministers, uh, to ministers. Uh, uh, Fakhr uh, al-Mulk, Shams, uh, Shams al-Mulk, uh, I don't know. Mm. Yeah. But that's how you're dating them to, to that? Uh, uh, it uh, mm, could, be date, uh, could be dated uh, due to uh, the um, period uh, the, a certain minister uh, 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 had uh, his position, his state position. So it's known, uh, for example, uh, from which uh, till which date uh, Fakhr al Mulk uh, was the prime minister, or uh, I don't know, uh, Mujir ad Din, for example, uh, uh, the ne next prime minister after uh, Fakhr al Mulk. Uh, so uh, this period is known. Uh, for each minister. So uh, it could be dated due to this uh, information. Well, it's, that's very interesting because um, usually, right up until 1095, he isn't really writing much in Persian at all, is he? Sorry? Al Ghazali doesn't really write very much in Persian in his period in Baghdad. That's why I'm surprised to hear that. Those letters are from that uh, he uh, recommended some persons to um, Khurasani ministers. Uh, so uh, in Khurasan, uh, the uh, state language was Persian. Of course, but I mean, this implies that he was in contact with what's going on in Khurasan while yes. he was in Baghdad. Yes, yes, but sometimes he visited <laughs> his family in Khurasan. <laughs> yes, yeah, so all that in the space of three years. Mm -hmm. would have taken them at least six months to get there, wouldn't it? I mean, this all, it's all very interesting, but... Um, there is a, a good translation of uh, his uh, letters uh, into Arabic, Arabic translation, modern Arabic translation. Yeah. And the translator, uh, given the necessary details to identify the addressees, <laughs> his addresses and uh, the dates. Good, well, I'll ask you for the bibliographical data for that. <laughs> okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Is it all right just to follow up with the well, yeah, yeah, the yeah. Thing, yeah. Thank you. Alice, just following up from Professor William Burnham, I was a student here in the department. 
sort of getting more attracted to Ghazali again, his way of, of shaping himself up in terms of you know, his academic outputs, like uh, we know uh, uh, in his early years, as you were telling that uh, in Baghdad he was uh, also writing letters, but, uh, letters of recommendation, but we know uh, whatever he was publishing or rather at that time writing those things, these are essentially different from what he came up at his later years and after his you know, wanderings of the arts completed and then he came up like say with the Eya Ormudin. So quite a difference in his mental shape. I was wondering in his uh, recommendations, so he had been recommending people uh, in his early days and again several times in the, in the later years as you say. Did you find a change in terms of picking up those people, any major change? Because as I say, when you talked about Ghazali itself, you know, there's ambivalence in his uh, You see, uh, first, uh, we have uh, a so-called English translation of uh, Al Ghazali's letters, uh, published in New uh, Delhi. Uh, but uh, in fact, this is uh, not translation. It's uh, something else. Uh, uh, then, uh, answering your question, uh, there was a, a, a standard pattern for writing recommendations. Uh, so, uh, any person who uh, who's going to, to write it uh, should follow this pattern. So uh, no much dif and if you addressing to 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 uh, uh, a prime minister or a minister of uh, uh, I don't know uh, or any minister you should follow this pattern and you should uh, mm, the most important part of uh, the letter uh, of recommendation uh, is the last one mm. so you should counsel first to the minister, uh, since you uh, represent uh, a religious authority. And then, uh, at the end of this council, you should uh, recommend the person uh, who would like to, uh, to, to, to take the state, posi uh, state position. So, no, not much difference. Any other questions? Well, I can't resist asking you what you think the letters um, published at New Delhi in English uh, are. Uh, are they a, a complete forgery or are they a paraphrase? No, 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 no. Uh, uh, I think uh, uh, a translator um, maybe um, um, uses fantasy uh, too, too much. We find uh, for example, in these letters, uh, uh, pounds uh, instead of dir dirhams. For example, pounds in uh, Sejuki times. <laughs> 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 or, uh, uh, I, in fact, I, I doubt that uh, he uh, follow uh, the text. Uh, maybe it uh, some kind of. Um, propaganda for local community. I don't know, but uh, I can uh, I can uh, call this translation uh, as a real translation. Uh, I uh, recommend not to use it at no. all. <laughs> no, well, I've looked at the Persian, but I don't know about this Arabic um, translation. Arabic, very good translation. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Very precise and very good translation. And you think the authenticity? Uh, that this work is really by Al Ghazali. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Oh. Okay, right. Uh, for those here and for those watching uh, online, we're going to take about an hour and ten minute break. Uh,